So hi guys. Uh, today our speaker is uh, Dr. Victor God from uh, ICTS TIFR Bengaluru. Uh, he's going to speak about half half wormholes in nearly antidecitor two holography. It is based on two of his recent works uh, with uh, his collaborator. Uh, thank you, Victor, for giving this talk for this QSTM uh, virtual seminar series. And we are welcoming to give you this talk so you can start. Okay. And um, thank you so much, uh, Santan, for the invitation. And I'm very happy to talk about my recent work with uh, Antonio Garza Garcia, who is in Shanghai. So, yes, it's going to be about half wormholes and the factorization problem. And uh, we will study this problem in the context of nearly ADS2 holography. So let, let me start maybe by um, reviewing what is ADS CFT. So ADS CFT is the proposal so, that- uh, Victor, yeah. could, could you please show your first slide, please, a little bit? My first slide? Yeah. Thank you. You can move. Yeah, no problem. Yes, so let's review what is ADS CFT. So ADS CFT is, is the simple proposal that two partition functions should be like exactly equal. So Z CFT here is the partition function of a CFT, and Z grav is supposed to be the partition function of quantum gravity, or let's say string theory. And the left hand side is well defined, but the right hand side is very puzzling. So for example, uh, if we have one boundary, so you can think of the partition function as like the pass integral on the thermal circle so of length beta, for example, and this would, this would compute Z of beta in the CFT. So this is on the CFT side. And on the gravity side, the prescription is the following. So you also have a thermal circle, but this thermal circle is only at infinity. And, and you are supposed to fill in um, any gravitational solution or to do the pass integral with such boundary condition at infinity. So in particular, when you have only one boundary, like the leading contribution is going to be this cigar geometry or the disk, which is also the Euclidean black hole. And, and we know from Gibbon's talking that uh, like, like the, the, this gives like the thermal passion function of associated to the black hole. So uh, like this is consistent with what we expect from ADS CFT. Like in, in a sense, ADS CFT clarifies a lot what Gibbons and Hogging did. But when you have two boundaries, um, it becomes more puzzling because let's say you have a left boundary on the CFT and the right boundary. Then of course, in this case, um, the partial function, the, the full partial function of the CFT is going to just factorize as ZL times ZR. But now um, the problem is that if you do the same thing in, in, in ADS, so you have to fill in these two boundary and, and you can see that there will be one contribution which is the same as above. But you might have also additional contribution that connects the two boundary, such as wormholes. And here, um, like the, the first piece here, so this piece here, is already the product of ZL times ZR. So it seems that this wormhole contribution is inconsistent with this idea because, because it's just not equal, right? And the, this is known as the factorization problem, which was first pointed out by Maldeson and Maus. And at that time, I think a reasonable, um, a reasonable solution to this is just to say, then let's forget about wormholes. Wormholes should just not be included in this pass integral. The prescription is just to, to forget about them. And, and this is perfectly consistent. Um, but so, Recent developments have shown that actually maybe this is too fast. So in particular, wormholes could actually be relevant if you consider average version of ADS-CFT. 
because if instead of having a, a single theory and single CFT, you consider like an ensemble of CFTs, then it's possible to have wormholes because the average of this square is different from the square of the average of Z. And, and so the wormhole captures this difference. And, and this is a very interesting idea because if it's true, so if wormhole can, can really be understood in average version of ADSFT, um, it gives us a semi-classical way to probe like statistical poverty of black hole microstates. So, you know, Gibbons Hawking formula um, gave us like a way to understand the Bekushan Hawking entropy, but it didn't tell us a lot about it. Basically, it, it just told us what is the number, the, the, the value of the entropy. Whereas using these wormholes, so if this idea is correct, we could get much finer information about the microstates. And so this has been shown quite explicitly in toy models, such as pure JT gravity. And uh, it, it has also been and is currently been explored in 3D gravity. But, but I think it's fair to say that there is no real evidence that it works in, uh, in like higher dimensional version of ADSFT, which, which are the case that we are really interested in. So like real black holes. And uh, one motivation for our work is to study a slightly more realistic version of like, instead of having pure jetty gravity, we will we, have jetty gravity with matter. And it's a bit more realistic because for example, in this case, you cannot do the full pass integral uh, as was done for pure jt. You have to, 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 you have to write it as a sum of saddle points. And, and this is also what we expect in higher dimensions. So in higher dimension, we, we don't expect to be able to do the full pass integral because it's obviously divergent. And, uh, and so we expect that some regularization would reduce it to some kind of sum of the saddle points. So and, from, and so, for matter, yeah. what, what you have taken here? Yeah, I will be more precise in a bit, but, uh, but, but I think the idea, we'll take a massless car field Excellent. for a particular setup. But in principle, you could study more general matter fields. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to review jetty gravity uh, in detail because I think most of you guys probably already know about it, but I'm just going to say that jetty gravity is a two-dimensional time model of quantum gravity. And I, I want to emphasize that we can view it in two different ways. Basically, there are two different point of view you can have on jetty gravity. So the way it was discovered, I would say, is it, is the way is in the relation with the SYK model. So in this case, you view it as a low energy approximation of some UV complete theory. So the UV complete theory could be like the SYK model, but it could also be like near external black holes, for example. Um, and, and jetty gravity is just the low energy approximation. But more recently, it was also shown that jetty gravity can be viewed as a full theory on its, on its own right. So UV complete theory which is actually dual to a dual to a wonder matrix ensemble. So jetty gravity is very special because it makes sense as a, you know, a, as a full theory. But here I want to take the first point of view. So to, to view jetty gravity as, as a low energy approximation, because I think it's, it's more realistic and it's more similar to what we expect in higher dimensions. So, so the question I will ask is whether wormholes in this theory, so let's say jetty gravity plus matter, can tell us anything about uh, the microstructure. So let's say statistics of microstates of SYK model. Um, yeah, because for example, in higher dimension, what we would like to have is, uh, I mean, the low energy theory is going to be like something like Einstein gravity with matter. And we want to understand whether wormholes in this theory can tell us something about the, you know, the UV complete theory, like let's say a string theory, of which, it, which is difficult to study directly. So, are there any questions at this stage? On this introduction. If any question, please ask. If not, then Victor will proceed. I think, Victor, you will proceed. People will ask okay. questions. 
Sure. Feel free to ask questions at any time. I think we have time. Yeah, so um, one reason to think that this might work, and I, I would say maybe one of the most successful examples of this idea is the spectral form factor. So you can compute the partial function z of beta by doing a pass integral. But an int interesting thing to compute is, is to anal analytically continue to like imaginary value of beta, so beta plus it, and to compute the modulus square of it. Because this quantity, uh, if, you, if you write it in terms of energy eigenstates, you can see that it will tell you something about the distribution of this energy eigenstates. And indeed, if you plot it as a function of this t, you can see this structure here. So you have a rump like this. And uh, sorry, you have a dip, and then a rump, and then a plateau. And this structure is extremely universal. So it is expected that basically any chaotic Hamiltonian is going to have uh, such a spectral form factor. So for example, uh, this plot is taken from um, a paper called Black Hole and Border Matrices. And in this case, it's, it's for the SYK model. And just to understand a bit better what, what, what happens there. So what you have is, um, at first you have some, some decrease th th that is like, uh, and then you have some very erratic oscill oscillations. Which, which depends on the specific eigenvalues. But what, we can, what you can do is you can do some average, let's say average on the SYK coupling. And in that case, it becomes a smooth curve, which is this rump. So now like we know that uh, SYK can be described at low energy by JT gravity. And actually this, this, um, like this dip here, is basically the black hole contribution. So like Z of beta plus it, so this quantity in gravity is going to be something with two boundaries. So, so for example, you would have a term which is like the, the disk and, 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 and the two disks here. So the two black, the black, if you want the two disks, you can think of them as two black holes. Um, they explain this deep here. But the, the rather interesting fact that was pointed out by Satch and Stanford is that this rump here can also be understood in JT gravity. And it's actually the contribution of the, the, the wormhole. So this connected contribution gives exactly the rump with the right coefficient. So, so, so this is a very interesting observation, I think, because it, it, yeah, it shows that this idea can really work. But hi, hi, Victor. One question. Yeah. Hi, hi. Yeah. So when when you say that you expect this behavior to be universal, do you mean that this should be true for any theory of gravity in any dimensions, or? Like yeah, it's even more than that. So it's it's it should be okay. Let's say. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so there is a conjecture in um, in the study of like strongly coupled system or chaotic system, which is called. A random matrix universality. And it, it's basically the, the idea that the statistics of eigenvalues of uh, the Hamiltonian, of a chaotic Hamiltonian, are always similar. And they always have this random matrix statistics. And as a result, like it is expected that any chaotic Hamiltonian will have uh, this spectral form factor. So these this three phases here. And, and indeed, it has been checked you know, in many systems and, uh, and it does happen. So, so of course, I, I think we expect it to also happen in quantum gravity because we expect quantum gravity to be chaotic. But of course it has not been checked out because we don't have any way to compute like the eigenvalues, right? But it has been checked in like, let's say, so here is the SYK, but you can of course also check it in random matrix theories and I guess in, in other chaotic theories that people have been studying. Okay, okay, thank you. But, 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 but like to give you more intuition, so, you know, you, you can view this as a, I mean, this quantity is roughly like, um, is, is, is roughly sum of, 
e to the i ent. Yeah, I, I think it's roughly of this kind. Of course, it's not exactly that, but it's roughly of this kind. And, and the point is that, so t equals zero, it, it's, it's big. And then when t starts uh, becoming uh, larger, what you have is that like, like all these are just phases. And because the EN, so the energy eigenstates, the energies are like a bit random, like you will have some cancellations between all these phases. And this is why you have this dip, because all these phases will cancel. But, but, but the, the interesting fact is that uh, this EN are not totally random. Um, they, they have this uh, feature called um, eigenvalue repulsion. And, and this is why you get you, you get this swamp here. So at some point it goes again. So it's a, so so this swamp really um, tells you something non-trivial about the statistic of eigenvalues. And so it's quite interesting that uh, you can sit in like the low energy theory of gravity. And but but then I, I want to go further and to ask. Uh, can we also see this erratic behavior in gravity? So is gravity restricted to, to tell us average quantities? Or can we understand also uh, how to see something like the erratic behavior? And another way to ask the same question would be, uh, can we understand what is the gravity dual of a single relation of the SYK model instead of you know, the, the disorder average SYK model? Yes, so, so this is just a brief summary of uh, this talk. So I will describe a Euclidean wormhole in jetty gravity with a massless color field. And, and I will show that it's dual to um, some SYK model with complex couplings. So we will have some jetty SYK duality. And uh, this wormhole will lead to a factorization problem. And we will see how this factorization problem is resolved by including new saddle points, um, which are half wormholes. And these half wormholes actually appear to capture features of like fixed realization of the SOA couplings. And more generally, um, I think this story suggests that you can always view the gravitational pass integral with wormholes as a kind of average of a uh, space time deep brains. And, and I will explain this in more detail. So this is the setup. So like this is the action of uh, JT gravity with the topological term here and then the JT action. And we just add to this action a massless color field. And now you, you can look at uh, this uh, this wormhole solution, so this double trumpet. And, and the unshared action of this solution is just uh, b squared times t. If you don't have the scalar field, it's just b squared times t. Where b is the, is the length of this, uh, of this geodesic circle here. And uh, the metric is, is given here. It's a, it's a very simple geometry. Um, and so if you don't have a scalar field, so you just have like this piece here, you can see that um, actually this, this geometry is not a solution. It's not a saddle point of the, of the pass integral. And, uh, and this is because you, you see like, uh, you can see that this level because B can, can be arbitrary. So you should integrate over it. And, uh, and B squared times T doesn't have a saddle point in B, right? Because it decreases as b goes to zero. So, what's going so to happen? To what is what is capital T? Oh, sorry, T is just the inverse temperature. Okay. So cool. these circles have length beta, which is one over T, and I'm taking them to have the same length here. Yeah. 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 So I, I was saying, like, so in, in pure JT gravity, this this is not a, a solution. But actually. Um, so what Sachin and Sunford did to, to take into account this contribution is actually to do the full pass integral. So to perform the integral of a B. 
Um, but this is not something that we expect to be able to do in higher dimensions because uh, the full pass integral is going to be divergent. And, and it's better to have settled points. It gives us more control on the solution. So, so, so here, we will see that by adding this kernel field, you get this additional contribution to the unshell action just by evaluating this unshell. And with this contribution, you can hope to, to find a settled point. Now, um, if you just look at this expression, you can see that if you take a derivative effect to B, there is a settled point, but the settled point is at a negative value of B. And, 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 and this is not physical. So there is no one for that negative value of B because B should be integrated from zero to infinity. So, so, so actually there's no settled point, even with a scalar field. And so here, the chi L and chi R are sources for the scalar field that I put at the boundaries. So, so the way this works is, is, usual, the usual, um, is using the usual ADS safety dictionary. Basically, um, the, you know, it's going to be something like the limit when what goes over pi over two of chi should be equal to chi R. So chi R is just the boundary condition for the scalar field. And same thing for the left one. But, but, but so here we see that actually there's no settled point if we take this setup, but there is a small modification of it, which gives us a settled point. And the idea is to take these boundary sources, KL and KR, to not be real, but to be uh, imaginary. And if, it, if they are imaginary, like this term will change sign and then you'll have a settled point. So let me explain this now. So now we consider these imaginary sources. So let's say IK and minus IK with K real. And, and if you do this, then you have several points. But like before going on, let me explain uh, why it is physical to do this, like why we are allowed to take these imaginary sources. Because here we have a real scar field, and it may be puzzling to, to add imaginary sources. Um, so in low chunk signature, for example, like this would be unphysical. Like you would had you would obtain a configuration that violates standard energy conditions. But here we are studying a Euclidean quantity, which you can think of this, the modulus square of Z of beta mu, because you can think of these boundary sources as a chemical potential. Like it's it's basically the same thing from the point of view of the passing integral. And, and in, in, in studying this quantity, uh, nothing prevents you to do an analytic continuation to imaginary mu. Like, you know, this is like statistical mechanics. You are just studying this quantity, so you can study it in different regime of parameters, including analytic continuations. And in fact, this is a standard trick to study the statical physics of complicated systems. So for example, it was used with success, I mean, with some success to study confinement in QCD, so these are some references on this. And in our case, we will see that by taking these sources to be imaginary, we will be able to study this quantity, like we'll have a better handle of this quantity because we will have like uh, saddle points in the gravity theory. So then the original action becomes this and then you have a minus sign. So you have a saddle point at a positive value of B and you can compute the free energy and you find that it's, it's a constant. And there is a competition here. Like, let me recall that here we're looking at the problem with two boundaries and we have the source plus IK on this side and minus IK on this side. And, and we have said that now you have this wormhole solution, which is one saddle point. But of course, there's also the black hole solution. So the, the disk solution here. And, uh, and there's a competition between these two saddle points. So like the black hole solution have this free energy, which is well known. Basically only this term is important. And at fixed temperature in the conical ensemble, the dominant solution is the one with lowest free energy. So the free energy of system is basically the minimum of the two. And you can see that there will be like a phase transition between these two states at, at some critical temperature. So what will happen is at high temperature, you have the black holes. But as you lower the temperature, there is a phase transition where these two black holes somehow become the wormhole. 
And before telling you more about this, uh, um, now I will talk about the dual setup, which is the SYK model with complex coupling. So the usual SYK model has this Hamiltonian. So well, well, you don't have this part. You just you know have four Majorana fermions, and you which which have some coupling GIJKL, and the GIJKL are taking to be Gaussian random variables. But here, what we're doing is we're adding a complex an imaginary part to this coupling. And in addition to that, we consider like two copies of this model. So a copy on the right copies. So yeah, uh, this is basically it. Like this is just the model we look at. And we can just, in, we, we can just compute the quench free energy. So like this quantity here. And of course, uh, this is not something that uh, you can easily solve analytically. So the way we do it is, is by exact diagonalization. So basically you take a value of n that is large, but, but still manageable. So we'll be able to go up to n equal 34, I think. And then you just like, this is a, a, a matrix that you can just diagonalize. It's a, it's a, some, it's a two to the n times two to the n matrix. And you can just compute, you know, the free energy once you know all the eigenvalues. And now you can just compare these two free energies. So this is the energy of JT gravity. So it's the plot of what I was saying before. So, you know, in, in this region, you have the, the two black holes, like the two black holes here, where the free energy is like, minus S0 times T. And, and in this region, you have the wormhole where the free energy is like a constant. And, and here you have the first transition. And the interesting thing is that in the SYK model, we see exactly the same thing. So, you know, like you would have expected to maybe suggest this line up, up to the end, because this is the line that corresponds to the, to the disk. But actually, at, at some temperature, you, you have a very flat piece here, which is, which is exactly the wormhole, actually. So, 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 so this is a good evidence that you can think of these two models as being dual, but I will try to be more precise. Because they both have exactly the same first transition and low temperature. But actually, you can be a bit more quantitative on this duality. Yes, yeah, so, so, so first of all, uh, in SYK, like this effect comes from this imaginary part here, whereas in JT, it comes from um, having this boundary sources here, here and here. And of course, uh, there is a sense in which, like you can view like this term here as a as adding a source at the boundary, just just by the usual idea safety dictionary. Like if you deform the Hamiltonian or the action. It's the same thing as, uh, you know, adding a source. But but of course, like this operator here is is very complicated. So 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 clearly, it's not going to be exactly the same thing as a massless scalar field in JT. But rather, the, the the way to think about it is that we view the massless scalar field as an approximation of of this imaginary part. So so the way to say it would be that. Like SYK model has some, uh, I mean, some unknown, but but uh, it, it must have some, let's say, um, gravity dual, exact gravity dual, which would be some kind of string theory, or we, we don't know what it is. And, and you can view this JT plus scalar field as a low energy approximation of this dual. So it's not an exact duality, it's an approximate duality. In the same way that you view like, let's say, Ashton gravity, in ADS5 plus matter fields as a low energy approximation of n equal force of mill. And, and to be a bit more quantitative about this duality, like you can actually compute the critical temperature in both cases, and it's scaled in the same way with this K. K being, okay, so K here, like K here would be like this kappa. So K is the deformation parameter if you want. And they have the same dependence. And another thing you can do, which is quite non-trivial, is to look at low energy excitation of the wormhole. So in SYK, uh, this is done by solving the schringer diagram equation as was done in that paper. And uh, in JT, 
you have to 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 find this uh, an effective short term action as we did, and in both cases we you find the energy gap go as chaos go out. So so I think like uh, these three things. So this having the same phase transition, the same dependence of the critical temperature on the gap, uh, sh shows that uh, this JT plus scalar field is a very good model of um, of SYK with complex couplings. It's it's better than uh, we we would have expected, I think. So so, so it's it, it's a good place to ask uh, the question of uh, factorization. So so first of all, Hi, um, Victor, uh, yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. So yeah. I, I so this uh, this is this is good, and 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 you're saying that you're drawing this conclusion by comparing the expectation value of the free energies. Is, yeah. is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, okay, this might be slightly tangential, but have you considered like uh, correlation functions of free energy with some other quantity and do, do they also have some sort of a match or is that hard to compute? Um, no, it's it's a good question. Like uh, it, we, we haven't really looked at that in detail, but it, it is something that uh, like, okay, in a sense, this, this gap energy comes from the two point function. So, so the fact that the gap matches shows that, and, and we have shown, shown that actually that the two point function, like, uh, so if you have the wormhole, you can put like, uh, um, yeah, I think it's the two point function of the scalar field when you have on each side, like you can see, show that this matches. And, and this, is, this is the same thing of this energy gap, of the match of the energy gap basically. But we haven't looked at higher point functions, but it's something that we should look, we, we could look at indeed. Like, yes, you can. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it would be interesting to see how far this goes, but to be honest, like we, we don't expect, you know, this to be an exact duality. It's, it doesn't have any right to be an exact duality. Like we, we yeah, so at the same time, yeah, we, I think this is enough for our purposes that time. So, so now, um, like, like this is a very good setup to think about the factorization problem. Like, first of all, if you if you look at the disorder SYK model, so when you have the average, like there is no real factorization problem in this case because you're already performing an average over couplings. So, so the fact that the wormhole appeared in the like in in the average SYK model is not inconsistent. You, you can think that the, you, you can say that the wormhole comes because you do some kind of average anyway. But the point is that even if you look at the, even if you look at a single relation of S O I K, like you you also have the wormhole in some sense because the free energy that I drew that I drew like like this, like the, like this was for the average S O I K. But for for the non-average S O I K, it's basically the same. The only difference is that maybe you have some small fluctuation there, but but you still have this flat flat piece here. And this, this flat piece you cannot understand in, if you don't have anything like a wormhole because without a wormhole, you would just have this line, right? So, 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 so it seems that the wormhole should be in, in the, in also in a single validation, but then, then of course it violates factorization as I explained before. Uh, and of course the same problem, uh, I mean, this is the, the basic factorization puzzle. And, in, and we will see how this can be resolved by adding new saddle points, half wormholes. So, so, so this was actually a proposal by uh, Sad Schenker, Stanford, and Yar earlier this year. And what they did is they look at the toy model of the SYK model uh, obtained by fixing um, like the SYK model at a fixed time. Because if you do this, you, you get a, a matrix model that can be studied analytically. And by studying this model analytically, SSSY found that at a, at a single relation of the coupling, so when you don't do the average, there are actually new saddle points, which you can think of as half wormholes. And they argue that half wormholes explain how factorization is restored in this case. So, so, so this is, I think, a very interesting proposal. And, and this is the proposal that we want to investigate. Yeah. Yeah, there have been some follow-ups on this. So for example, this has been extended to complex as well as by Paul uh, Mukhamidzanov. 
And I can also mention that uh, Scienton and Sirius uh, have some work on this in terms of models. So in this case, there is no average. And uh, yeah, so to say a bit more about SSSY, so SSSY really looked at a simple situation. So in some sense, it's it's a toy model of SYK model, which is already a toy model. So it's like a toy model of a toy model. And, and for example, this model doesn't have any gravity dual. So it, you know, they argued that it has to behave like a half wormhole uh, just from the uh, from the behavior of the green functions, but but they didn't have a real gravitational picture. And uh, one of the goal of this work is to give this gravitational picture. So to really construct these half wormholes in gravity and to see how they resolve the factorization problem. And we'll see that actually the proposal of SSY is, is true in our case. So it's all the same way. Okay, so now uh, let's describe the half wormhole solution. So like basically the half wormhole is obtained by allowing the space time to end on some kind of deep brain. So basically by allowing the space time to have some boundary condition, the way, what can end. Like this is similar to like string theory. If you think of the space time being the world sheet, like, uh, you know, the world, the string can end on deep brains. And, uh, and so the way we define this boundary condition is as follows. So we impose that the exchanging curvature vanishes and we impose that the scalar field, uh, chi of tau zero, so this, the work on it is zero in this case, has to be equal to some function j of tau, which we fix. And, and, and you can check that uh, these boundary conditions are consistent with the variational problem. And you can also check that for any choice of j of tau, you get a unique solution. And the solution looks like this. So it's literally uh, the, what is called the trumpet geometry. Uh, where you have some, where well, the space time ends here uh, at this red boundary condition. And this is the metric. And here uh, I'm using this plus because just to say that we have this source plus IK. So yeah, it's a pretty simple solution to this guy. And um, like it's done in more detail in our paper. I, I didn't want to, to include too much technical details here, but I'll just write down the exact on-shell action that, that you get. So you can write it in terms of, of the Fourier mode of this J of tau. Excuse and, me. Yeah. Uh, can you go back one slide? Yeah, um, sure. yeah here, uh, is the end of the world brain not enough? Sorry? Is the uh, end of the world brain is not enough? For you? Yeah, okay. Just so. You can think of this as a end of the world brain. And indeed, like from the perspective of this geometry, it's exactly the same as an end of the world brain. But but I think it's important to make the difference. Like the, there's a conceptual difference between end of the world brain and uh, space time D brain or SD brain. Like, like, like the point is that the end of the world brain is something that is intrinsic to, to the geometry. Whereas the space time D brain is extrinsic. So it's something that, for example, if you have one SD brain with this boundary condition, J, like, like it means that you, you can also have other geometry with, with the same boundary condition. Like it, it doesn't have to be like only one because they oh. can all end on the same SD brain. So it, it, it's a, the SD brain lives outside of space time. Whereas the end of the world brain is, is more like, is the way to view it if, if you live inside the space time. But yeah, at the end, there's the same thing. I see, I see, thank you. I mean, th this concept of SD brain was um, introduced by uh, Marol van Maxfield, I think, um, in this paper called Transcending the Ensemble, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and yeah, so they, they use it in the same way we use it here. But yeah, so, so it's, an, it's a kind of a new idea, this SD brain thing. I mean, it, it was also discussed by Satching and Sunfall, actually. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show like uh, this interaction 
because everything is explicit and uh, you can do all computation exactly. And what is nice is that uh, the theory is one loop exact, at least around this solution. So actually you can compute the exact version function in this case, and, and we did it in the paper. But I'm not going to bother you too much with technical details. Like just, just to tell you that you can obtain the on-shell action and uh, you can look at saddle point in B and you find the solution at a complex value of B because the, the half of mole is actually a complex space time. This is not very surprising. It's expected, I think. And, and I just wrote the exact partial function. And I, I must say that uh, like, uh, uh, like for this presentation, I'm, I'm just showing you the saddle point on B, but of course, what you have to, to do in reality is to solve the equation of motion of JT gravity, et cetera, and, and, and to, to see that everything makes sense. And uh, at the end, it's equivalent to just doing the saddle point on B, which is simpler. Yeah, and then like, okay, so, so now we have this new solution and, uh, and, and the question is how to think about it. And the way we think about it is as follows. So like uh, the solution depends on an arbitrary choice of function g of tau. And, and what's nice here is that this g of tau contains a lot of information. I mean, it can be any function in a circle. So, so, so you, you can hide a lot of information in this boundary condition. And this allows you to, to model some kind of microstructure if you want. So, and then what you can do is you can, like once you have the theory uh, with these half wormholes, you can consider averaging over this G of tau. So for example, uh, like a general average would be, would look like this. So you just integrate over G uh, with some weight that I write as an exponential like this. And uh, yeah, basically you can choose anything you want for this function S. Um, like I, I just present two examples here. So let's say for example, this and this, and, and, and just, just to, to give you some pictures, you, you can see what, a typical version looks like. So here it's very like noisy. Uh, here it's it's a bit less noisy, but yeah. But basically the idea is that uh, you'll have a lot of complexity there. And, and, and the main ideas that I want to convey is that this average of a G of tau um, is we're going to argue that this is the dual of doing the average of a SYK coupling. So basically the, the point would be that the gravity theory when you have half wormholes, but no wormhole, just half wormholes, should be dual to SYK at fixed couplings. And doing the average over the couplings is the same thing as doing the average over this boundary condition G of tau in gravity. So, so, so to make things uh, a bit clearer, um, let's distinguish between two gravity theories that we have. So we have, a simple gravity theory, I'm calling simple, which is just JT gravity with a massless scalar field. And, and you just do the Pallis integral, including all wormhole geometry, but no half wormholes. So no SD brains, nothing like that, just the usual thing. And in particular, this theory doesn't factorize. So this is the factorization puzzle. But now we also have a, what you might call an exact or maybe less simple gravity theory which is defined by, by, to be the same as simple gravity, but in, you don't have, in this case, you don't include wormholes, but you, but you allow these half wormholes. So you allow an arbitrary number of these SD brains, let's say. And, and, and this theory manifestly factorizes just because uh, you remove wormholes. And, and I think, my, I mean, our, our main result I would say is that the simple gravity theory is actually, an, you can, we can show that the simple gravity theory is the average of the exact theory. And I will explain why this resolves the factorization puzzle. So is this clear? Like, is this idea clear? Uh, Victor, just maybe one question about this. Um, yeah. Is it, is it correct to say that like uh, both of these are non-unitary theories or both are- Yeah, are yeah, yeah, of course, unitary. non unitary yeah. Huh. yeah. E even this um, exact theory is non-unitary, right? What do you call as yeah, the yeah, exact yeah. theory? 
Yeah, no, nothing is unitary. Yeah, yeah, we have a complex Hamiltonian here. So, so the, the, the point is that uh, like unitarity is important in Lorentzian signature when you have like a Lorentzian time evolution. But 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 uh, here the story is completely Euclidean. So basically, we're just doing statistical physics. And, uh, and in this case, it's useful to deform the Hamiltonian by an uh, imaginary term, even though it makes it non-unitary, just because it allows you to, let's say, uh, probe some, you know, let's say the statistic of the eigenvalues or something like that. But yeah, it's non-unitary for sure. So there is no Lorentzian, there is no Lorentzian picture here. There is no Lorentzian continuation of this story. At least not, not uh, I haven't been able to make it consistent. Yeah, if you want, like, uh, um, in general, it's quite difficult to, to be able to study these wormholes because there are like non perturbative contribution to the partial function in gravity. So, um, in general, you won't be able to study them. And, that, and that's why it's, if you want to be able to say something, you'll have to do something like what we did, I think. So for example, going to, allowing this chemical potential to be imaginary, allows you to have several points. And it's a perfectly valid thing to, to study. Uh, of course, it would be better to maybe to study the a more physical quantity or like to study like the real SYK model that uh, fix couplings like without the uh, imaginary part, but yeah, uh, I don't have any approach for this. All right, okay, thank you. And, S and, and yeah, so SSSY, for example, wasn't able to do this. This is why they study SYK at a fixed time because it was too hard to study SYK, the real SYK. Yeah, so uh, I just want to, to give you, a, uh, to, to, to tell you exactly what we have shown. Like to be honest, uh, the the proof is a bit technical. Like it it involves like, um, for example, it's it's dependent on this one loop contribution and things like that. The Casimir energy of the star field. So I, I don't want to include these details, but if you're interested, I'm happy to discuss them after, or we can you can just look at the paper. But but basically, what we will show, what we have shown is that this half form hole is something that is. Um, very sensitive to the coupling, of, for sure, of course. And it's not a self-averaging quantity. In the sense that if you average it by itself, it just gives zero. So it's something that disappears when you do the average. But if you average it, if you average a pair of a pair of half warm hole, like here, you get exactly the warm hole. And, and actually, like uh, these two things is is what you need to resolve the factorization puzzle because for example um, like to give you an example let, let's say you compute the the two point function uh, z minus z plus so so here if you do it in the exact theory so it factorizes you know it's just the product of these two parentheses and you can expand these parentheses and you get four terms and now if you take the average like you can see that this term and this term would vanish because the half form hole vanishes and then this term gives a warm hole so, so, so you see that from the simple gravity, from the exact, let's say what I called exact gravity, you, you get you get exactly the simple gravity after doing the average, and, and you can you can check this for more for more observable than just this two-point function. But I'm just presenting uh, this. Yeah, so uh, like, like, like of course to do this, you need to choose the correct ensemble and uh, this is explained uh, more in the paper, but basically the point is that you can, you can view the simple gravity as, as the average of this exact theory with half form holes. In particular, the exact form hole partial function is reproduced by the average. So it's, it's, it's um, I mean, it's not approximate, it's like, like the, the exact partial function, including the one loop prefactor, so it's exact because it's one loop exact. You get exactly that actually. And, and it, it sounds like a bit of a miracle, but actually one way to think about it, 
is because if you think of the of doing the pass integral in the simple gravity, like you, you, you will have to sum over all geometries and integrate all the fields on these geometries. And in particular on the wormhole, you, you will have to do the pass integral on the scalar field. But let's say that you, you do the pass integral in two steps. So, so let's say that you, you first integrate everything except the value of the scalar field at the geodetic boundary. So what, what you might call G of tau. Yeah, if you do this partial pass integral, you actually get the same theory as with half wormholes. And, and performing the average of a G of tau is, is, is basically the same thing as finishing this pass integral. So, so this is why uh, doing this average gives you exactly the wormhole because you are just finishing the pass integral in some sense. So it's not a miracle. And, and it's something that should happen more very generally because you can always you know, uh, do the pass integral in two steps and uh, first not do the pass integral over the, the middle of the wormhole and just declare that uh, when you don't do that, it's because you have these uh, half wormholes. So uh, yeah, I just I just wanted to to explain why do, why it works, and then you can look at the details in the paper. And, and, and I think maybe this is um, a, the idea I want to emphasize on because it's also something that should apply in higher dimensions. That anytime you have a, a wormhole solution, it should be possible to split it into two half wormholes. In a uh, and these half wormholes, these half wormholes are going to be defined in a theory where you have these space-time deep brains. And by doing an average over these space-time deep brains, so over all possible you know, boundary conditions, you will always recover the wormhole just because you are just finishing the pass integral. Um, and uh, another question you might ask is, um, is the wormhole present in the non-average gravity theory. So like in the theory, like in SYK at fixed couplings, is there a wormhole? And naively you would say it's not present because we have excluded it by hand. But actually there is a sense in which it is present because the, the pair of half wormhole, you know, is actually very similar to the wormhole. Like if you, like the, you know, the free energy is basically equal to it. And the only difference between the two is going to be a small correction. So for example, you can write an equation of the form, this pair of half wormhole for a fixed J is the wormhole plus some small correction. And this small correction, you can just do it like that. And, the, and in the SSY story, it's what they, they call the linked half wormhole. And the point is that this correction here is small and averages to zero. So. You can always you know, think of it like in this way, and in this picture, factorization is restored because you, but you keep the wormhole, but you add this extra link contribution. But equivalently, you can also say that you don't keep the wormhole, but you consider these half wormholes. Of course, this is equivalent. But yeah, so, so the important point is that uh, like having these half wormholes um, solved the factorization puzzle in this case, because it explained that, um, like in a theory with fixed couplings, like you don't really have the wormhole, but you have these half wormholes which mimic the wormhole. And this is why, like this is why you, you also see this uh, constant free energy at low temperature, for example. So are there any question on this? I don't know, maybe I'm going a bit fast. If there is any question, please ask. Oh, it's actually, yeah. And now, like, uh, uh, of course, like uh, something else you can consider is to just look at uh, one boundary. So you consider the free energy of the gravity theory with half wormholes, but only for one boundary. And then in this case, you have the disk plus the half wormhole. So this is the new contribution. And you can compute the free energy of this setup. And in this case, the free energy is complex because you, you know, the solution is complex and you can plot the real part. So the real part is the same as the wormhole. So you, you have this, you know, this first transition here, but the imaginary part is interesting. It has this very like uh, distinctive, uh, so like shape. And, 
you know, the, the, like, like we wanted to argue that um, this theory with half wormhole is dual to SYK at fixed couplings. So what we can do is to just plot the free energy of SYK at fixed couplings. And we did, we did it. So in this case, this is, you just have one SYK, so with this, and you just plot the free energy of this model for a fixed value of the coupling. So just pick some value and you plot the free energy. And so this is the real part and the imaginary part for different parameters. And it's quite striking that actually it matches remarkably well. So the real part uh, also have this resolution, but this is something we expected because, you know, we already knew that if you have two boundaries, um, you have this first transition and the real part of the free energy of one boundary is the same thing actually as the free energy with two boundaries because, you know, the sum of this, like having those boundaries, having the complex conjugate and uh, the free energy just sums. So the, it would, you know, the free energy of the two boundaries is the same thing as the real part of one boundary. But what is interesting is this imaginary part here. So the imaginary part has exactly the same shape as as what we see with the half form hole. And I think this is a really non-trivial fact, which shows that uh, like this idea that the half form hole captures single realization um, is, is in the right direction. So let, let me mention a bit more about this. And actually we can try to be more quantitative. Like, like, like this is of course qualitative because we don't have, it's not an exact duality, so we can only like compare the free energies and you know try to change a bit the parameters and see how it evolves. And, and by doing this, like, like we find that the zero mode of this G of tau, let's call it J zero, is actually dual to the center of mass of these couplings. So like if you have a fixed an arbitrary a fixed relation of the coupling, so like that. <laughs> Like, of course, like, uh, like, you know, this contains, like this, a choice of s couplings contains a lot of information, right? It's choice of um, n to the power four numbers. And, uh, and of course, this simple model with a scalar field is not going to capture all this complexity, but you can hope that it will capture some of it. And indeed, like if you consider the following observable, so you just take the mean of it, so, this is done by just summing over all i, j, k, l, and the number of terms. And you define, you call this z. And, and actually, you, this z is, is the dual of j0, roughly. And you can, you can show this by, by varying, for example, j0 and z and, and seeing how it evolves. But another way to see it is actually the gravity picture gives you an analytic formula for this imaginary part, which looks like this. So here, the arctan of tan is just a way to to take the, you know, like to take this expression modulo two pi, basically. That, that's why you get this cell thing. And, and now you can just compare this analytic formula that you get from gravity to the SYK results and, and it's an excellent match. So, so it's, it's quite interesting because like in SYK, I, I have no idea how you would derive this formula. And it's interesting that the gravity gives a simple way to derive it. And, and also it tells you what is the dual of this boundary condition at, at the SD brain. Like the, it tells you that this idea that the boundary condition at the SD brain is the SYK coupling um, is somehow true, at least in this approximate, you know, at least in some approximate uh, regime. Yeah, so this is what I said, so. So I think, I think it shows that uh, JT gravity with our is dual, of course, in this approximate sense to SYK at a fixed version of the coupling. So indeed, like JT, you, you should view this JT plus scalar theory as a low energy approximation of what would be the true dual of SYK. And of course, this boundary function J of tau is not going to capture the full complexity of the coupling, but it might capture some of these features. And of course, the idea would be that if you have a more complicated gravity model, you could capture more of it. Um, yeah, and uh, so, so let me conclude now. So basically we have obtained the half a mole solution in JT gravity plus matter and shown that they resolve the factorization puzzle. 
we have argued that the non-average theory is a theory with half arm holes ending on some D brains, and that is dual to SYK at a fixed relation of the couplings. One way to understand like um, how this works is to think of this average of SD brains as finishing the pass integral in the simple gravity theory. And this is why it should always be possible to, to split this wormhole into two half wormholes. And, and indeed, so this idea generates to higher dimensions. So, so for example, uh, like if you have any theory where you have a uh, wormhole saddle points, like you can, like, like if you have wormhole saddle points in any gravity theory, there will be a factorization puzzle. And you can solve this factorization puzzle by, by changing the theory a little bit. So basically what you do is you split the wormhole into two half wormholes by introducing this SD brains and allowing these boundary conditions. And by doing this, you would resolve this factorization puzzle, at least the one associated to this particular wormhole. And you would get, you would go from a simple theory to a less simple one. And by doing this systematically, you could hope to, you, you, you could hope to go closer and closer to some more exact theory. So for example, it would be interesting to, to try to do this in equal force pair on mills. Like in this case, uh, some wormhole solutions were constructed by Mauer from Santos and also in other cases. And, and, uh, and, and these wormhole solutions are very similar to all wormhole solutions. So, so I expect that it should be possible to find also half wormhole solution in this case. But, but I guess the, the puzzle here is that it's not clear it's not clear to me um, what this SD brain boundary condition mean from the point of view of n equals four, but they must mean something. So there must be like, let's say some kind of modification of n equals four that is dual to having this SD brains in the bulk. And if we understand this, then, then, the, then we would understand that by perf performing an average over these modifications, we would get the theory with wormhole. So in particular, this will tell us that the, the wormhole solution in that you can get in like the ADS5 effective theory captures some uh, st statistics of uh, states in this modified and equal force So I think it would be an interesting thing to do. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Victor, for the talk. If there is any question, please ask him. Any comments, clarification? Yeah, Victor, can I maybe ask one question? Sure, uh, sure. So, uh, I mean, here, here, as you said, the uh, like, so as you were trying to construct the dual of SYK plus matter, you had to mm -hmm. modify S. Sorry, dual of JT plus matter, you had to modify the boundary conditions you have in SYK. Um, I, I mean, I, I was just wondering, like, wouldn't wouldn't one also expect to add some matter fields on the SYK side in order to match with JT plus matter, or that's just a wrong expectation? No, no, no. So uh, you, you shouldn't add. Uh, I think we don't want to add anything on the SYK side because, like, a SYK, if you want, is already in some sense. Yeah, we we kind of know that it's already like JT. Uh, it's equal to JT plus uh, plus uh, lots of matter actually, right? I see. Like okay. if, if you look at uh, like yeah, it has it has this uh, very like um, low energy. Low, it it has all these operators of low conformal dimension, and, and this is why JT gravity is not is not a, the dual of SYK. Like uh, we don't understand what is the dual of SYK, but it, it it's it should be more like a kind of string theory. Uh, which in the low energy approximation gives you JT, but 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 so in this case, uh, like 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 to, this is just a very particular setup where um, if you have this this imaginary part which you can view as a as a as a chemical potential, so you 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 add a term to the Hamiltonian, you deform the Hamiltonian in SYK then you, you can view this as doing the same thing on this side with a massless star field. And, and of course, so here you would have H, let's say plus, and you add some I K times M. And M, M would be some complicated operator in SYK, like uh, basically this, the one I wrote. 
and this, this like in this case you would have so if you write the action let's say so the Hamiltonian it would be like the action of JT plus a, plus a source term from for this matter field so it's, it 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 does something like O times um, um yeah just O O being the operator dual to the scalar field let's say something like that so basically what you're doing is let's write yeah, you can write otherwise the Hamiltonian if you think of Hamiltonian term. So, so, so here, what we're doing is we're approximating this complicated operator M as just uh, the operator dual to a scalar field. So, of course, it's not a very good approximation. And, uh, I'm not claiming it's it's a good approximation. I'm just uh, I'm just trying to model the situation uh, by a gravity story. And of course, uh, you ex expect a lot of things here. But but just by looking at this uh, this sector, this simple sector here, you can actually reproduce most of the features of the SYK model. And I think this is uh, maybe one of the interesting interesting things that uh, I don't know. You, you probably shouldn't expect. I, I, we didn't expect that it would work so well because yeah, just because here it seems that it's a very complicated operator, and in this case you can all model it by uh, a scalar field. Um, Right. So, yeah. Uh, sorry. One more. One. Yeah. Sorry, Victor. I mean, uh, so so uh, this this dot dot dot, which contains lots of matter. Like, can you give an example where it becomes important, or is it like? Yeah, of course. Like, like um, when you study the SYK model, like it it, it it's only like JT. So it it, on, it only resembles JT when you go to low temperature. So it's only at low, at low temperature that uh, it's similar to JT, but in general, it's completely different. Like in general, like uh, like something that that we don't have and that would clarify a lot of this would be to to find the, the exact dual of SYK. In the same sense that uh, string theory on S five is exactly dual to any proposed by middle. Like if if you find the exact dual of SYK, so maybe it's some kind of string theory on ADS two. Then you would see that by taking a low energy limit or low temperature limit of this theory, you would get a JT gravity plus some other stuff, and then it will be more precise. But um, but yeah, so so it's JT is only an approximation of SYK at low temperature and for simple operators. Like this is similar to what we do usually in ADSFT, right? Like um, yeah. just that in that case we don't have we we just don't know even in principle what is the dual of SYK. But uh, but yeah, it's similar to when you consider like ADS five gravity as a low energy approximation of an equal four. Oh you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if there is any other question, please ask other participants. Okay. Shirish, do you have any question? No, sir. I don't know, maybe. Uh, so I have to say thank you again, Victor, for this talk. Uh, Thanks a lot for the invitation. And, yeah, and this will be uh, posted in the YouTube channel. So I will share the link with you. And okay. uh, yeah, so those who haven't attended, for them, if you look into this talk uh, in YouTube, if you have, after uh, going through the talk, if you have any question, you can ask question to Victor as well. So you can write to Victor, he will be happy to give you the answers. Uh, is that okay with you, Victor? Yeah, sure. Okay, so bye for now. Yep, thanks a lot. Bye.